Welcome to Become an Idol. I'm Dr. Robin Sargent, owner of Idol Courses. This is the place where newbies come to learn and veterans share their knowledge. I have here with me today, Anya Hartlib Parson, and I met Anya through a 2020 recap that we did with Tom McDowell, and um, we've also kind of talked to each other on LinkedIn, and Anya said, I want to talk about data, data science on a podcast, and I thought, oh boy, I would just love for you to come talk to us about good data in learning and development on Become an Idol. And so here she is um, to share with you about data and her journey and her story. So Anya, will you please do a better job of introducing yourself? Sure. Yes. Um, my name is Anya and I am a, a data scientist or data analyst in you know, broadly speaking, but my focus is in people development. So that encompasses training and uh, learning development, talent development, recruiting, all these good HR functions that you can think of. And really the, the aim of my work is to make sure that whatever programs we put in place, we can measure that they actually have the intended impact that we're looking for. Um, and how did I get to that? Well, as many people in, in learning and development, I sort of got to it by accident because most of the jobs, well, really all the jobs that I've had, had some sort of training component. Sometimes it would be a, a good chunk of my job description but sometimes it would also be someone just coming into my office and saying, hey, we need some training. Could you maybe do that? Anyway, so, you know, it, so I would jump in because I just, I like teaching people. I like, I like helping people get better at whatever it is they want to do. And so, but I never really had this instructional designer or learning and development title on my resume. So that's what I've been trying to focus on in the last six months or so to get into that area. And as I was talking to a lot of L&D folks, uh, I noticed that the data part of things seemed to be a bit of a challenge. And since I love data, I thought, well, you know what, maybe this is where I make my, where I carve out my niche or, you know, make my little, um, little molehill. I love it. Yeah, for sure. There is definitely parts of um, L&D that are not that sexy. And so some people might think that that would be the data, but I am sure that you are, you know, an evangelist of just how important it is um, in what we do. Otherwise, we're just making um, cute little videos and we have no idea if they are actually working. Yeah, that's that's actually precisely the point. Um, because, you know, and I, I love to design things and I, um, you know, love to put things together that help people learn something. But, you know, the question always in my in the back of my mind is does this actually work um and i think that the value of being able to show being able to demonstrate that what you're doing as a as a learning and development person as an instructional designer actually helps people do their job better I think that's that's really important, and that's a value for for you as a as an instructional designer to market yourself with. It's funny because I've looked at a lot of instructional design portfolios, and you know it sort of depends, right? But when they some instructional designers do a good job of talking about 
the process that they went through in developing this particular learning item. But the results are often, or well, rarely, I mean, mentioned. And, you know, if I'm putting myself into a recruiter position, um, I would wonder, well, you know, what are the results? Uh, plus, you know, when we talk about resumes in general, the push is always to quantify your achievements, to put some some numbers behind what you what you've done, rather than just list the things that that were part of your job description. Oh my gosh, it's so true. And um, I even tell my students, like, if for instance you're creating a portfolio project and you are doing it outside of you know volunteer client work or or any of those other means to your end then put the types of metrics you would use in your case study as far as the results go, right? Because it's like sometimes for portfolio things, it makes sense like, okay, so you couldn't get real data, but you still, just like you said on you, like you still got to show that you know how to think through that data and think through like what kinds of measures are important, measurements are important and what are those metrics that you can use? So I think we should just kind of um, level set on you and like, let's, let's talk about like when we say data, what the heck are we talking about? Yeah, so when we think about the probably most used model in evaluating training in the Kirkpatrick model, you're looking at all these levels and what I see done fairly well is evaluating the level one and two, you know, so which really pertains to the experience that the learner has with your with your learning item. Um, so it's it's satisfaction, measuring sort of satisfaction uh, or you know, as sometimes is <laughs> cheekily referred to as the smile sheets. Um, so that that's that's okay. Um, but if you think about it, just because someone was satisfied with the learning experience, or they enjoyed it, or they like the instructor, or whatever, doesn't necessarily mean that they're going to perform their job better afterwards. That they've really learned something. Um, I just chuckle every time I see someone asking on some kind of post course survey, you know, how were the facilities and I just, what does that matter? I guess you had great cookies, but um, anyway. <laughs> so that, you know, um, and, and also think about if, if you've been, if you've taken some classes at the university, you get these post, uh, post course surveys. And a lot of that is really at the level, level one evaluation when you're looking at the Kirkpatrick um, uh, Kirkpatrick model. So other data that we really should be looking at is questions like, uh, and this can be done with surveys, that would be sort of the low hanging fruit, is does the learner think they're going to apply what they've learned in this course? Of course, a better question would be, and this would be somewhere time down the road, have you applied what you learned in this course? Because intention is one thing, but actually taking action is another. So I would say, don't just leave the data collecting to, you know, at the end of the course, make sure that you're collecting data a little further out uh, past your delivery so that you can better assess the actual, the true impact of the learning you've delivered. Yeah. And a lot of this data though, I mean, we're talking about evaluation on you, but I'm sure that you would say that it starts right at the beginning, right? As far as like, before you ever get to like evaluation, you should have oh, yeah. clear understanding about what are you going to measure at the end? Because that affects your entire design 
And then it affects the design of your evaluations is all the way back to the beginning. Like, what is that data? What are those metrics that you said success looks like? Right. Yeah. Yeah, that that's a good point. So, you know, if you're if we're going into the topic of, well, how the heck do I do this? Where do I start? Um, it really starts with your needs analysis. And I personally think that if you have not done a very thorough, and I mean to the bone needs analysis, your learning is going to be at least less successful than it can than it could be. And so when you do your needs analysis, and you need to make that point with your stakeholders that this is a really important investment of their time. Because uh, we all know that stakeholders don't have time, or at least they say they don't have time. Um, so we want to look at, okay, someone comes to you and says, uh, can you build me a course on X? Don't leave it at that. Um, ask, okay, why? And then ask why again, and then ask about three more times. So you actually get to the root of what it is that they're trying to address. And from that, when you get an actual problem statement from your t stakeholders, you, then you're going to ask, okay, how, how do you know this? Do you have some data on this? Um, it's not enough to just go by someone's opinion or sentiment. It's, it's better to have some actual hard numbers. So if they're saying, well, you know, we feel like our, um, our department isn't really engaged. And so the productivity is suffering. Um, make sure that that can be measured somehow. So you maybe go to employee engagement surveys, which probably every company these days does. Um, and maybe you look at some productivity data in sales. You might look at, well, how is this, how are the sales looking, um, for the last six months or year? And you take those metrics and you look at that as a baseline. And having a baseline will help you then, after you've delivered your training, to remeasure and see if those numbers have moved at all. Um, you know, so the, the baseline is really the most critical thing to me when we're, when we're starting with developing learning. Uh, and I realized that sometimes um, it's not very easy or next to impossible to get a baseline. Um, but if you are asking the right questions, you can probably in uncover something that could be used to measure. It may not be perfect, um, but it's, it's better than nothing. So how how deep do you think it you actually have to go before you move on? Like you've mm. got to get your learner analysis. You got to, like you said, ask all those why questions, um, go see if there's any existing data. And then maybe you think, OK, well, I don't know what productivity is um, and mm -hmm. they don't have any real data. So how am I going to go and measure their productivity? data and say I get like one slice of it. Like, so if productivity, um, you know, for sales is about, well, how many calls are there, are they making? How many follow-ups are there, are they making? Um, how many like closes do they make based on, you know, the amount of leads and it, it can get really deep. And so I just yeah. wonder like, how deep do you need to go? Or do you just need to justify that there is a productivity issue and specifically where or like what's kind of like your yeah. move on stage so um if i had my way i would go as deep as i need to but that may not be real realistic um and and you're right about that so this is again part of the needs analysis where you would talk with your stakeholders okay what's 
what level can we compromise on? Okay, maybe we don't have exact productivity data, but we have some kind of proxy for it, like you were saying with the sales figures. Um, and, you know, sometimes you could even look at, I mean, again, it's an imperfect measure, but every company does performance um, evaluations at least once a year. So, you know, that would be data you could look at. Again, that makes it a little bit more of a long-term project, but, um, or you could look at um, what I was talking about earlier, where let's, let's look at um, the, the level of, are people actually applying what they've learned? Um, and so maybe your stakeholders won't agree too much more than that. In other words, you say, um, before you deliver the learning, um, you look at, you know, what the, what, what learners are saying their gaps are, um, and where they want to improve. And then after the learning, uh, you say, um, have you ask questions about how how useful to them in terms of the areas they want to improve uh, in was the learning. And then later down the road, you ask, have you been able to apply what you've learned uh, on your job? And that may be as far as you can go uh, based on your specific circumstances. Yeah. So um, when you are looking for kind of like your checklist of like getting data, you really just want to know, you know, what is it? How many metrics do you do you go for? Anya, is it like, I want to know, I need a learner metric, I need uh, the situation type of metric, and I need to know um, which um, piece of data is going to move at the end of the training or what, what exactly is kind of like your mental checklist you got going on? <laughs> um, I hate to use the old philosopher's answer. It depends, um, but it depends. <laughs> um, I think, so if you're looking at, let, let's, let's make this um, simpler. Yeah. If you're looking at the Kirkpatrick model, you know, you have the four levels, reaction, learning, behavior, and results. You take that and in your needs analysis, you figure out um, what data you can use to address all those four levels. And like I said, and like, you know, that's not always possible, but so if you get beyond level two, that's great. Um, if you don't get beyond level two, I think it's really important to say to your stakeholders what the caveats are um of not having you know more in-depth measures of what the learning is actually doing but then you as the person who's designing all the learning have also covered your ass if that makes sense of course <laughs> you know you then you say okay we can't go much beyond measuring uh what the learning is but you know we're all in agreement you know that's what we're doing um and but what i would always try to do is find at least one or two metrics for each of these levels uh if possible um so that would be the way i'd go about it from the beginning now ideally ideally you have past learning that you've developed and you can draw some measures from that so you're not completely uh, starting from scratch um but when you're looking at that you can also sort of back paddle back um uh paddle and and think okay so we developed this course last year and so the data we have on this shows X, Y, and Z. What else could we have done uh, to figure out whether the learning actually made a difference for the learners and the company? Uh, and then you go from there and you just 
you know, try to do more on the next project that you're developing. Um, but if you're asking me, okay, how many exact uh, metrics, that's really hard to say, uh, <laughs> unfortunately. And I hear, I mean, I'm just thinking about what kind of questions um, people listening might be asking. And I'm thinking, okay, so we can always, it makes sense that we can do some data analysis on sales and at, tie some metrics into did sales improve after this training? But when you get yeah. into things that are behaviors, like I think we yeah. kind of mentioned, like soft skills, like we just want people to stop being rude in emails. <laughs> How the heck do you measure, measure like a rudeness of e emails or email communication? Yeah, that's a really good question. And that is a big, um, big area where learning um, needs to improve, learning analytics needs to improve. But as I've been mulling that particular part over, um, I, I think a good start is looking at what kind of data is available through human resources. So for instance, if you're developing a leadership program, um, one thing you can look at is employee satisfaction and engagement data. So you're rolling out this training program to um, teach, you know, leadership skills or to improve leadership skills. And then you take uh, the, you look at the job satisfaction or employee satisfaction, employee engagement numbers for that particular group of leaders. Um, by the way, that reminds me of another point, which is, I really think that these types of programs, while well, really any programs, it's not good to just like dump something onto every learner you have. <laughs> you, it's better to segment into groups. So that way you can more easily parse out, for instance, in the leadership development example, um, you know, you have leaders in sales, for instance, and then you can more easily parse out how that impacts the employees under the leaders through data that your HR department hopefully has. Um, but soft skills are, are difficult to measure in, I think, I also find that it's more difficult to justify those types of learning investments to leadership because of that. Um, so, you know, whenever you can, and this sort of is a general point also, sit, to, sit together with other departments that would be involved or that pertain to the learners you're developing learning for and ask them, hey, what kind of things are you measuring? And is that something that this training might impact? Um, and then, well, how can we connect the dots between what we're doing and the data you're having, you're collecting? Yeah, yeah, and so I, I get what you're saying, you know, like soft skills is something that's, you know, tricky to measure. Um, and then what about this argument that I hear a lot on you where um, there's kind of two sides where mm -hmm. um, I've heard somebody say, you know, what's the ROI? What's the return on investment for training? And so we're mm -hmm. always about like, what are our metrics? How do we measure things? But then just like we have here, our example, which is like soft skills training, um, maybe the data is not always clear that points that, oh, the training made all the difference. Yeah. Um and so some people say, well, training's not necessarily a return on investment as much as it is to protect your investment, which is your, you know, the development of your talent and keeping your talent. And where do you fall in that space? Um, I, I think that's a little too simplistic in my, in my opinion. So that viewpoint you just talked about, the thing is, um, we we think about return of investment a little bit too shallow um the and and again uh just you know to dissuade anybody's fears you don't always need to measure return on investment 
Um, the, the thing, for instance, with soft skills is it's not necessarily okay. Um, have, have we gotten better leaders and, you know, how does this compare to the cost of the training that, you know, we have, and do we have some positive bottom line as a result? It's more looking, for instance, again, going back to these employee satisfaction metrics, has this has the training positively influenced um, the people that these leaders are responsible for that they're leading and you can i think talk about that also as a learn as a return on investment because when people are happy uh at work we know that productivity is better we know that they produce more um that they um that they're more invested in the company and that they're more likely to stay oh, by the way that's another thing you can look at um, retention um, or attrition rates of employees um, or even just um, i think it's an imperfect metric whether they would recommend this company to other people who are looking for jobs um, so talent attraction so it's to me it's much rich, richer than doing a cost benefit analysis if that makes sense um it's looking more into even few the future impact of that um and how it may impact the growth and well-being of the company down the road but i do want to address this other point that you were making which is really important well it's not just training that affects these things. Well, that's true, but that doesn't matter. That doesn't mean we shouldn't measure what training is doing. It just means that when we have measured things, we put a caveat and say, well, so as far as we can tell, um, you know, here's what happened after the training and training, um, we, we're going to credit ourselves with some part of that success. But we realize that there are obviously other factors that play a role. So, you know, don't be the one saying, oh, this was all due to my perfect e-learning course. Of course not. <laughs> um, just, you know, it, it plays a role um, in, in increasing the um, success of, of your um, department and company as a whole. Okay. And that's okay. Yeah. Like. You know, it, it's it's okay to say we don't fully understand how much, like as a percentage, for instance, training contributes to these results. But, you know, taking that as an excuse not to measure, that doesn't, to me, that doesn't track. Yeah. Okay. So we know data is important. We know that we can put caveats in there. All right. So I am ready. I've got a new project and I'm going to do some needs analysis and one of the easiest ways, of course, to get data, just like you've already mentioned, Anya, is surveys. And so now surveys, of course, the way you structure them can skew the data that you get. And so do you have any kind of like high level tips as far as like writing those surveys and or maybe even some resources that you want to point somebody that's new to writing surveys to? Yeah, I actually am working on a couple of things right now, which is quick guides to um, to survey design and then also to um, um, developing a, a measuring or data strategy for your learning and development. So um, I will <laughs> I will give you those things to point to um, in the show notes. Survey design, uh i i'm i i hate to say that it's not the easiest thing in the world but it is and it requires experience the first thing you want to make sure when you are designing a survey is that you're very clear about what it is that you're measuring and that you're only measuring that one thing so the way you're making your questions has to make sure that it's just measuring that one thing and not something different or something else. 
um, the classic example is double barreled questions. And that's just to say you're asking two things in one question. Uh, that's the first thing you want to avoid doing. Um, and it's interesting because, you know, I see questions that are double barrel questions that people might not even recognize they're actually asking two things. So uh, don't be the only one looking at your questions. Go test that survey. Um, go, you know, maybe have other colleagues, um, maybe more senior colleagues, look at it. And then also take maybe if you can a small sample of your learners and um, put that survey to them and then gather feedback from them, particularly in the way they thought about the question when they read it. Again, I realize that's not always possible, uh, but you know, if you can, um, just select a small amount of the le of the learners you're actually going to have in the course, and um, and ask them for feedback on the survey. Um, that can help a lot uh, because you may not realize how people are actually interpreting your questions. Um, I always, when I design surveys, I literally uh, ask, I start with questions at like a four-year-old level <laughs> and then I kind of work from there because, you know, you have to be extremely clear with four-year-olds. Like, you know, you can't be using your big words and, um, you know, asking things that are a little bit more complex or whatnot. Um, start from there and then kind of, you know, add more words or rephrase it uh, as you need to. Um, so that's that's one thing about survey design. Um, so I, I also mentioned the testing aspect of it. And then there are a couple of books that I would recommend. The thing is with survey design, it's it tends to be a very academic topic. So, you know, you've got people in psychometrics and whatnot, um, uh, you know, kind of writing books on that. And that's just a little, it can be a little too technical. But I did find a couple of books that are much more like lay audience level. Um, and so I can I can have I can get you those links as well. Yeah. And then um, I just think about when I think about surveys, uh, I think your double barrel question um, is, is important. And so, I mean, that one's pretty clear. But if we were to give an example, Anya, it would be something like if you in the same question, are asking them their favorite color and why they like that color or are you asking them like their favorite color and their favorite food in the same question what what do you, what do you can we get specific about an example of a double question? yeah yeah so for instance um uh was was this course enjoyable and useful to you mm that's a double barrel question um, and because think about it, the course may be enjoyable, but that doesn't mean it's useful <laughs> and vice versa. So we, we dump adjectives into questions without realizing that we're actually asking two things and that those two things may not be going, you know, may not be things that are rated the same way by a person uh, or that are that could actually go in opposite directions if you you know like you know yeah it's enjoyable but not very useful um so that's difficult for a learner to express obviously when you're just giving them one rating scale <laughs> yeah and do you ever find that um you try to limit the amount of questions you include in your surveys just to get higher completion rates yes. yeah Okay, well, yeah, we can talk about completion rates because I know that's a that's a bugger. Um, uh, that's a bugger. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, yes, I think you you should focus on only asking the questions that you absolutely need and want the answers to. And, you know, if a person can complete your survey in five minutes, that's that's my personal 
um, measurement, like can they do it in five minutes? Um, that's probably the best chance you get, um, you have at actually having them complete the question, the questions, the survey. Um, but, you know, survey uh, completion rates vary so drastically. It's really hard to tell, to say, okay, you should shoot for X amount, you know, X percentage. Um, I, I think that, um, you do want to look at okay so we're asking 10 people okay and we have a 10 percent response rate that's no good you might <laughs> as well not use any of those but if you have a hundred people and um well even with 100 but let's just say you have uh i don't know a thousand people and you get like 300 responses you know, that may be okay. Actually, this reminds me, there is a website where you can calculate what kind of um, response rate you need to have a decent, uh, you know, to have sort of a significant number of responses to draw conclusions from. And remind me to send you that link as well. Um, Cause that can be useful. But again, it's like a, it's it's just a gauge you know if you don't get there you don't get there so uh, the other thing you want to make sure to incentivize people to complete your survey is to make your argument for well if okay i'm i'm oversimplifying if you don't want to sit through another boring e-learning course fill out the survey so <laughs> we can do better but basically you know because here's the thing with employees, right? Um, they invest time in your training and uh, a lot of training is boring. <laughs> and um, so we want to make sure the training department, we're listening to the people we serve and we, we tell them, tell us what we need to do better. Tell us why this didn't work for you. Uh, tell us what you got out of it, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and I see people use like incentives, like, uh, you know, gift cards and whatever else, you know, your company may allow. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's kind of, that can work in a pinch. I am not a fan of using that constantly as a strategy, but, you know, sometimes that's just what you have to do to get more responses. You know, like I was saying with a, okay, you're serving a hundred people and you're only getting 10 responses and you really need more responses. Maybe that's what you have to do to get more responses. Oh yeah. I mean, I have uh, surveys throughout all my courses, Anya, and uh, I, I definitely put some incentives in there. I've put things like get a coupon for another course or, <laughs> I mean, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. But in your case, you have the added advantage that people are actually spending money on your training, right? And so that's already a built-in incentive. That's usually not the case for employees. I mean, right. for employees in the company, they're just spending their time. Although, you know, that's time that they can't use to do their job and it might put them behind on their job and blah, blah, blah. So, you know, that those are the things to consider. Um, Another thing to, to do is make sure that the leaders of the people you're um, delivering learning to are behind this and say, you know, and champion this, this, this data collection um, aspect of the training. Um, because if leaders are not really behind it and pushing it, you know, that makes it difficult to get um, participation from the learners. Yeah. And a lot of what I like to do for surveys and, um, I like putting this in front of you, Anya is, um, every, every question I have, I try to tie it to some kind of point system, you know, whether it's a Likert scale or, or something where I can tie it to points. So it's easy to read that data, but I always include at least one place where they can just, you know, put their real thoughts in there. 
because sometimes you will find a lot of surprising information when you can just get that qualitative data too. Um, I remember one time I was doing a survey about a, a software that people had to use in the company as a recruiting software and they've just, they just, nobody was getting it. And so I put out this survey and everything had points to it, except for at the end, I was just like, what, you know, tell me what, what it is about. It was called e-recruit. Tell me about e-recruit, what you don't like. And I just found out so much information that it almost came down to, it wasn't a training need after all. Instead, it really is just a crappy piece of software. And they <laughs> ended up, you know, changing the applicant tracking system. And it was because yeah. of, you know, that qualitative data that we saw. We're like, yeah, it's not training. They know how to use it. They just, they just think it's crappy and it's better to go these other routes instead. That's a, that's a really good point. And that kind of goes back to that needs analysis stage, right? Where you may get that pushback from your stakeholders that they really think training is necessary. And if you cannot break through that, uh, because you can't I identify what the true source of the problem they're wanting to solve is, then, you know, you do that at the back end and leave some room to get input from the learners about, about exactly that. Um, I, I think, yes, you're right. It's easy to just click a number on a scale, but there are these open-ended questions that can be very useful and that you can glean data from. How to analyze that is another topic because it, it's it's a bit more involved and you need to think about that. Like think about the level of, you know, the amount of time and, and level of um, skill that you will have to put to analyzing qualitative data. Um, but and so I wouldn't, you know, I've seen surveys where it's literally all open in the questions and it's like 10 open in the questions. And to me, that's just lazy yeah. from a survey design perspective. It's like, tell me everything and spend the next hour on it because I haven't figured out how to ask these questions in a different way. Please don't do that. <laughs> um, now, another thought I had as you were talking is uh i am almost 100 percent certain that there are other areas in your business or in your company that already do surveys marketing does surveys all the time obviously so talk to marketing if you need help with designing surveys you know those are other experts within the company you can tap into um and um as with anything in learning and development data, you probably already have resources within the company uh, that are that have the skills and the expertise to help you with data. I my aim, and I should have said this from the beginning, is not to make data analysts out of instructional designers. You know, you should be focusing and you want to be focusing on designing great learning. That's what you that's that's why you got into the job in the first place. Um, but um, and having a high level understanding of what data can do for you in designing good training and for you as a professional and for your learning department, you know, when it comes to talking about budgets and making more investments, et cetera, is really important. Um, you know, and hey, if you can champion hire champion hiring a data analyst for your learning and development department, or if you're a freelancer, uh, maybe you want to partner with someone who's really good on the data side, but who also understands or who has the cap the capability, the potential to understand the learning and development field in particular. You don't need to do it all by yourself. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, um, you know, just another thing that I noticed too, Anya, when I, you know, lived inside a company as full-time employee was that, you know, some like the, for instance, that 
example I gave about how, you know, it was the software that was crappy. Um, it's that they felt comfortable giving that information to like, you know, the training department about their frustrations that they would not share with their bosses or the executives mm. too. And that's kind of another just, you know, benefit of the training department doing the analysis and sending those surveys out from them because they don't have the same kind of fear. Well, if I complain about the software to my boss, my boss is just going to think that I'm lazy and I'm not trying. But if I tell the training department, then they might actually be more of an advocate for me. Yeah. And I'm not going to be seen as somebody who can't solve their own problems. Yeah, that's, that's a really important point. Um, and so, you know, whenever you do these kinds of data collections, you know, make sure that you are telling learners it's confidential. You know, this isn't something that, you know, we're not going to go tattletale on you with your boss. Um, but here's another thing to kind of promote uh, learner feedback. And I think that is reporting from in communication from the learning and development department itself to out to the company, which is to say, here's what we've been doing and here are the results that we've been seeing. And, um, you know, even if it comes to when it comes to feedback, here are the changes that we made based on your feedback, because it's really annoying giving feedback and not seeing anything come out of it. Um, that's where you lose a lot of employees because they just, well, what's the point? Um, so try, try doing that. Um, also, I don't know, put out a monthly, uh, learning and development update or something like that. And don't be afraid to report. Yeah. I, I realize this may be a political issue, but you know, report, um, negative results, like, you know, that because we learn from failure and uh, learning and development a lot of times is experimentation because we don't know the right solution right off the bat. Yeah. And I think that, um, I know this might be a good point to just kind of reiterate what you've already kind of said, but, you know, we have to do our best as far as collecting data and really, I, it seems, you know, just kind of having this conversation with you that if we could just get a few concrete pieces of information, like who are our learners and what is that, you know, one thing, that one behavior that we are trying to change and how we're going to measure it. And if you can get like this as a minimum, then we are doing a better job. Do you think so? Or do you think I should add, we should add more to that? No, I mean, that that's exactly what you're looking for. I'm not sure that that you always just, you know, are able to use one metric for those things. But um, I, I think it's really important um, to to exactly try for that. Uh, but when we're talking about behavior change, um, we need to, as part of the needs analysis, uh, at least make a note of all of the other factors that may impact that behavior. Um, so, you know, that we can show, uh, you know, our training can, you know, training is part of the equation, but we also have these other factors, taking our example of crappy software design <laughs> that need to be addressed to see a full impact of, change in behavior. Um, so make sure when you're doing your needs analysis, um, you know, to uh, point out, here's the training. We, we think a part of this can be addressed with training. And so that's what we're going to measure. And then here are these other three important factors that impact this particular behavior that um, uh, the stakeholders need to be aware of and need to deal with. Yeah. Okay. So somebody, okay. So now we are all very aware of the data. It's about collecting surveys, uh, maybe talking to the HR department to see 
it, what kind of data they have. And then is it all about just kind of crunching some numbers and seeing like percentages and how do you know, like, I mean, this kind of seems obvious, but maybe, you know, your data science mind will um, give us some insights that I didn't think about, but how do you know, what are the kinds of things that stand out to you when you're looking at the data? Are you just looking at numbers of people that submitted it and what makes things red flags and what makes things like normal and do you got to plot mm. curves and <laughs> uh, here's the good news no you don't have to do you know you don't have to do whatever uh, regression analyses or um prediction models or you know like this more advanced level stuff sometimes a lot of times you look at uh, percentages you look at averages you look at um deviations from the average which you know in statistics it's called the standard deviation that is you look at um okay so we've got a hundred survey responses to the question of uh, how useful has this learning been for you you know you see like and let's just say we have a one to five one to five scale one is not very useful at all and five is very useful and then you see that the majority of the responses are somewhere around like three. But then you're seeing a bunch of outliers, like in the one, uh, more in the one area and a bunch of uh, outliers to the other extreme. Um, looking at what the average is and where the outliers are, that in itself can give you some really good um, insight into what might be happening. Um, and you could then, you know, ask some more questions. Okay. Why, you know, why are we experiencing these outliers where we've got a bunch of people over here on the scale and they're not even close to the average what's happening there. Um, so I said averages, deviations, outliers in the data. Um, that's pretty much the most basic thing you can focus on that you can get uh, real, you know, that you can gain a whole lot of insight um, out of. So if you see that the majority is three, but you see, you know, people have given it a one and then other people have given it a five and the majority is given it a three. Uh, does that mean that it wasn't, I mean, overall, it's not that useful? Hmm. Or are you saying, like, look at um, deeper, like, maybe if they mm -hmm. attach their name to their rating, go talk to them yeah. specifically or something? Uh, that could be one thing. But um, when we talked about adding open-ended questions, mm -hmm. look at the answers in the open-ended questions. You know, so if you have a question that's, um, you know, you have this question of how useful was it and you add an open ended question to why did you respond that way, mm -hmm. then you can get get some additional thoughts, uh, data on, um, you know, why, why you may have gotten the results that you've gotten. But yeah, um, if you can talk to your learners who have rated your learning uh that that's really great too i knew you know that's a time that's an additional time investment um but based on the importance of your training like strategic importance of your training say this is like you know you're you're working on a leadership development program um training and this is this is coming from the boss boss you know you probably want to do that deep level you know, investigation into the data you're getting, because it's, it's a high priority, um, high value item, um, according to the organizational stakeholders. Okay, so now I have kind of like a just totally different. Um, Anya, so can you just kind of describe what your day to day looks like as a data scientist in uh, people development? <laughs> Well, um, 
right now I'm I'm looking for jobs. <laughs> That's my day to day because um, I haven't been able to apply my data analytics skills specifically in that area, but I want to. Um, what I've been doing uh, um, in my day job, and as far as the data analytics piece is, I look at uh, I look at sales. Um, sales training data and sales. Um, uh, so, for instance, one of the things that we look at is you know, how uh, how many referrals are we getting from the banking staff to the wealth management program to the financial advisors in our program, and so that's the kind of stuff that I analyze. Um, on a daily basis, but when I'm working on data stuff for this particular thing um, or trying to get a job, I look at how to. I'm doing a lot of research on how to improve learning analytics and how to help people within learning and development. Do exactly that, so data literacy. Um, ideas about where to look for data and how to analyze the data, how to champion better learning analytics in your organization or with your uh, freelance clients, if that's what you're doing. Uh, so really being a resource for for the field on, on this particular topic. Sorry, I don't have any job results to report <laughs> yet. But um, just to give you a, a, an interesting data point, <laughs> since we're talking about mm -hmm. data, um, when I put up my 2021 goal on LinkedIn, uh, which was, uh, and by the way, feel free to connect with me on LinkedIn, which was to um, really become a resource for learning analytics and data science, I had an insane amount of views. Um, I think by the latest count, we're at 31,000 views of the post. So that's LinkedIn famous right there. That's LinkedIn viral. <laughs> so I, I, I kind of cautiously think I might have hit on something. So anyway, um, but the job, the field, isn't very rich on those types of jobs yet. Um, it's better in the human resources um, um, area, a little better, um, but it's it's really me literally trying to to build this <laughs> this this aspect of learning and development. Um, yeah, yeah, and I just want to. Um emphasize how useful data is for your design. So Nicole Papiano, she has a course called Data to Design. And the reason why I mentioned it is because I just love her title because it's so true. Just thinking about it, like data to design. If you get really good data, really dig in there and find out like, what is the source of the problem? Where are the learners currently? Maybe even get some data as far as like their pre-knowledge before they ever get into your course. Then you really have the foundation kind of set for you as far as what are you going to design and what are you and you know what you're going to measure and just like with learning objectives they're supposed to be measurable and then they're supposed to be instructionally aligned throughout your entire course. If you do your data right, it makes writing your learning objectives easy. It makes designing your content easy, and it makes, of course, creating your um, assessments and then your follow up evaluations a whole lot easier if you set that good foundation in the right data yeah that and that that's um, that's the really um probably one of the easiest things you can do is at the beginning of the course ask um you know learners to assess their initial knowledge um on on the topics of the course and then you take the same measurements after the course 
And again, not just right after the course, but you know, further down the road, because we all know the retention problem. Um, and it's funny because I cannot tell you how many online courses I've taken. It's kind of insane, but this, the percentage of learning design that actually does that, like the pre and post measurement is sadly very small, <laughs> which kind of mind boggles me a little bit, but, um, yeah, just even start out with that. Or if you need to figure out yeah how what's the modality in which we should deliver this training uh like would a job aid suffice or do we you know do we need an e-learning model or could it be whatever an instructor-led session um you know you can collect data from your learners about that uh and you know and and that might you know very very little very much depending on who the learners are. So, you know, for one project, you may have figured out, you may have learned from your learners, they, the e-learning format was very, was what they, what they needed and wanted. Um, but that doesn't mean that that's what you should be doing for all your uh, learning projects. Yeah, for sure. So I think that this, I mean, you know, you'll share some resources, Anya, um, for the show notes as far as like books and you're creating some materials, it sounds like. Is there any kind of like last best tips that you'd want to give somebody who's new to our field about data or um, getting started on the right foot? Yes. <laughs> uh, and that is, that's basically the way I started. So when you get a learning request um and you 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 ask yourself this the question how can i measure that what uh, the learning that i've developed actually made a difference you start with that question and if you don't really know the answer to it yet you don't really know how to measure it go on linkedin ask your network which is probably hopefully full of learning and development people and get some feedback for them or be part of a learning and development community and ask uh, what other people have done. That's the quickest way that you can get some ideas of how to measure things. And this community is, and I'm not saying this lightly, probably the best professional community I have encountered in terms of how helpful and how kind and how willing to um, invest time into, um, you know, helping someone else they are. So don't be afraid to ask other people what they've done because you don't, you don't need to be an expert on this. You don't need to become an expert on this. You just need to go where you can most likely find the answers to your questions. Because that's what makes you a good learning and development person, right? Go find where you need, where you um, go find your, uh, the knowledge that you need. Yeah, go ask some good questions, right? Because that's what getting data is, right? Just asking good questions. Yeah. Yeah. So I like it. I like that you said that you don't need to become an expert in data analytics or any of that kind of stuff but you do need to value its importance and you have a whole supportive community to help you out if you ever get stuck. Exactly. And if you're in that situation where as a freelancer or as a, uh, you know, working for a company, uh, your stakeholders don't want to measure anything, uh, which, you know, that happens. Um, you go, go ask the community, how how they've tackled that particular problem um and um you know that that can help you make a better um you know make a proposal to the stakeholders of how to do things and get buy-in on actually measuring something yeah and even when um you know you're creating your portfolio assets or whatever and you don't have a job you can still send out surveys to your learners i've seen people even do it on facebook groups right like hey 
I'm needing some needs analysis for this. Here's my survey. Will you guys help me out? And then, <laughs> and so they'll just send out, you know, basically, which is like a, a survey that's um, just kind of trying out their hand. And so maybe if you've never cr created survey and collected data, maybe that'd be a good place for people to start. Yeah, that is, that's a really good point. And I do want to uh, circle back to what you were saying very early on, which was uh, talking about portfolios, um, all, you know, always try to include, even if nothing was measured or just only some things were measured, what else could have been measured? What, um, you know, what things, what other things you might, um, have wanted to know. Uh, and so that shows that you are really thinking about this level of analysis and that you are valuing data as part of your as as part of your job. I love it. Anya, thank you so much for joining me today. I just um, I hope that we have sparked and I'm sure that you have um, just some uh, renewed interest in data and its importance and that really it doesn't have to be intimidating. But we, you know, it's something that it's important and we we can start off small and, and ask our community. So thank you so much. I really appreciate you. Oh, no problem. Thank you so much for listening. You can find the show notes for this episode at idlecourses.com. If you like this podcast and you want to become an instructional designer and online learning developer, join me in the Idle Courses Academy where you'll learn to build all the assets you need to land your first instructional design job, early access to this podcast, tutorials for how to use the e-learning authoring tools, templates for everything course building, and paid instructional design experience opportunities. Go to idlecourses.com forward slash academy and enroll or get on the wait list. Now get out there and build transcendent courses.